Good morning and welcome to these, uh, what is this, August 18th, Partner First. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how to leverage cyber insurance as a risk manager. Uh, take you outside of the IT mindset, take you outside of working on tech, uh, and go back and actually learn how to manage the risk for your clients and for yourselves, honestly. Uh, so you know the deal. This is Partner First, bringing out subject matter experts, vendors of note, and all the things you should know as an MSP. Uh, this is going to be recorded, so everything we do and say here will be immediately available right afterward on YouTube and LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, we want to hear you in the chat. We want to see you talking. We want to know. Uh, I already see a bunch of you in there. So don't be shy. Say hello. And, uh, you know, let us know what you think. Uh, first and foremost, I want to get started off. We have some awesome guests with us today. Uh, first, coming back uh, to Partner First, we have Mr. Reed Wellock, who has... Actually, Reed, did I just butcher your last name? Wheelock or Wellock? Everyone butchers it. I mean, you, you pick your poison. Everyone butchers it, but it's well. <laughs> Regardless, it's, he's a cool dude to hang out with at, at conferences. So I'll just put it out there that way. Um, but, you know, he spent years dedicating his career to developing expertise in cybersecurity. Um, Reed, tell us about your background and, you know, your role over at Fifth Wall. Yep. Uh, I simplify it. I'm a unique breed because I'm a cyber insurance nerd. So um, about seven years ago, I decided to dive headfirst into getting to know everything about cyber insurance. And uh, I started working with Fifth Wall. So just quick orientation. Fifth Wall is think of us kind of like a distributor um, in the insurance world, right? So we're at, the, we're at the top of the food chain. We provide access to all the carriers and we only do cyber. So uh, I have read more cyber policies than I care to admit and uh, build a business around it. So that's what brings yeah. me here today. And uh, despite having read all those policies, he's still asking to do it again. How ridiculous is that? Uh, and our next our, our next guest, no, uh, he's no stranger to the punishment that is MSP and security and the channel. Uh, welcome, Mr. Wes Spencer. How you doing, my friend? What's going on, <laughs> Ray? It's awesome to be with you. Man, your new studio is looking sharp. Thank you, dude. I I, I don't have the uh, the Matrix door behind me yet, yeah. but I, I'm trying to do it with the... Uh, with the frame behind me, dude. You, yeah, you it's looking me. legit. <laughs> so, um, for like the two people on the internet who don't know you are who you are, um, you first were over at Perch, right? You created Perch, awesome product, snatched up by Connectwise, and they're doing great things over there. And you said, "This was so fun. Let me do it again." And now you're over at Fifth Wall. What are you doing over there, dude? So you can blame all of this on Dustin Bolander. Oh yeah. <laughs> So, I usually do. I mean, yeah, most stories end up with Dustin Bolander in the middle of them somehow. But uh, yeah, so I took some time off after I left ConnectWise. I stayed there for a year, just kind of helped with the transition out and um, took some time off. And Dustin was like, hey, I have this cyber insurance thing I'm working on. And I know you were, you've been talking about cyber insurance for a long time now. It's crazy, right? Because even at IT Nation Secure two, two, two years ago, I was on the main stage on the keynote. It was like, you're going to see cyber insurance drive this whole future faster than you see regulation for the MSP space. And then Dustin comes along and he plugs me up with Reed and team. And he's like, they're trying to build an MSP program. I'm like, I love that. I want to help. So I started as just like a part-time kind of just advisor. And then before you knew it, they're like, hey, why don't you come on board and help build this thing? So I've been doing that since like, I don't know, Reed, it's only been a couple months, but yeah. it's been gangbusters, dude. It's been fun. And and not just with Perch, your background is in security. You were doing yeah. that in the banking industry well before that. Um, can you give us some insight what you're doing back then? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I, I was actually teaching cybersecurity. I taught a whole bunch of people um, at Murray State. I was like a professor. And then I moved from that over into, um, into banking. I just kind of got burnt out of education. And the cool thing, Ray, is I learned I've, I'm an educator at heart. It's who I am. I've just not built to like do it in the formal way, you know. And so I got really involved at my bank, um, was deep into like cyber threat intel, like threat intel sharing all of that. Um, my bank was the very first that ever built out a uh, threat intel platform um, for community, like smaller banks, banks 10 billion and down. And um, before you know it, I got elected in as a member role to financial services ISAC for their um, uh, community council. So like 
I got in charge of like 4,000, 5,000 banks and credit unions trying to like figure out this threat intel problem. And, and that's how I, that's how Perch all came about, by the way, like that's another story, but you know, just in terms of like pivots and changes, but we built Perch originally to help small banks handle their threat intel. And then we sort of like grew and changed from there. So yeah, I'm definitely a cyber nerd through and through. Oh, looks like we got you on mute. Oh, sorry. I got to do it at least once an episode, right? It's, it's just part of the show. Get it out of the way. Um, but, uh, and you're, you're a little bit into uh, crypto. There goes Simon, first mute of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for those that know, no separate from the cyber insurance shenanigans, because, uh, you know, let's be honest, that's what it all is, right? Um, that If not, we're not having fun. Uh, but go check out uh, Wes's channel also, where he talks about all sorts of cool, cool, cool things that I don't understand a bit of. Um, we'll nobody understands to, it and if you look at the market yeah. the crypto market it crashed like no one knows what's going on what's, what's the dollar value of dictator coin right now uh well if you'll uh, buy some it's really really you know i might have minted i think a hundred billion so if anyone's listening to this and wants to be a um a, a dictator coin millionaire you let me know i'll hook you up cool so um i want to talk about Let's get this. I always like to define what we're talking about before we start talking, right? And it kind of feels like, yes, there were those keynote speeches. There were a few conversations years ago about cyber security insurance. And then there was, and it kind of just ramped up. And I can't remember the last conversation I had this year that didn't have cybersecurity insurance somewhere in the context of the conversation. And it's not even when it's like a main point, it just gets brought up naturally Anytime I'm talking to, to technology professionals, um, Reed, can you help me out here? Why is this so relevant today? I'm not saying it wasn't relevant five years ago. I'm just saying sure. you can't have a conversation today without bringing it up. Yeah, the, the two worlds kind of collided pretty quickly, right? We had um, so for those that you know don't follow the cyber insurance news, which most don't, but uh, when this all started. I mean, when, when cyber insurance really started picking up, it was around 2016, 2017, right? And the, the underwriting, you know, the, the, the process of the criteria they're looking at, right, to define a risk was really, really terrible. They were not looking at the controls. They weren't really evaluating the risk. They were just trying to write policies and get uh, land share. Well, that only lasted for so long as we know, and the market kind of crashed in a way um, we had ransomware that, that came up and all of a sudden the, the claims came in and you had a forced sense of urgencies, a uh, forced sense of urgency from carriers to better define their process. Right. And now they actually started looking at security posture. So you would look at it, Ray, obviously Wes would look at it and go, what are you guys doing? Right. Like who is running these ships, <laughs> these billion dollar organizations? But yeah, no one's really running it well to be looking at security posture. So long story short, you've got an industry that is now saying, OK, we've woken up. we got to start defining what good looks like. And it's falling right into MSP's lanes because, you know, they're asking business owners to have certain table state controls now. Right. So they're, they're saying, OK, here's the baseline criteria. And who's implementing this? Who's managing them, right? And so for those that have become really savvy around this, it is a very, very leverageable conversation, right? You've got, you've got something now where insurance is uh, almost like this disinterested third party that's just saying, we need you to just to like have the basics and we've defined them and MSPs are going, well, this is great because we've been saying the same thing for a long time. <laughs> so- hey, Ray. Yeah. I, I found out how they make their insurance decisions. These carriers, they, I, I, uh, I happen to have had an inside look and they have witch doctors behind the scenes and mm -hmm. they kill chickens and they swing them around their heads and then they throw it wherever it lands on their control is where they implement. New priest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what was that read? I've said, I'm pretty sure Dustin Bolander provided some of those chickens. Yeah. Yeah. As, oh, as, I'm as sure. A, he, he loves chicken. So if you ever does. run across Dustin, the two things he loves, SBS faxing and chickens. Uh, <laughs> so, so, Wes, your background, you, you're working in banking. You come up with a solution, bring Perch to Bear to MSPs. I mean, you're, it's already around security, but I imagine on the banking side, there's already there's already, you know, risk mitigation, protecting against loss, having insurance policies. These are normal things. These are normal business. When you get in the MSP space, 
back in the perch days, I say that like it's so long ago, were you hearing about cyber insurance as a, as a common conversation topic? The reason I ask is because the people you're talking to generally are a little more knowledgeable, right? They, if they're already having the perch conversation, if they're already having the security conversation, one would imagine they're, they're a little more operationally mature. They understand the risk factors. Were those people having the insurance conversation back then? You know, in, in my experience, they really weren't. I, I feel like this all blew up onto the scene about two years ago. Um, I remember going through all the insurance motions for cyber insurance for a direct cyber policy for my bank um, back in 2013, 14, 15. No big deal. I felt like a bank had to do that. Like, it's just it's too important not to. Um, but I don't remember, Ray, like in my perch days, clients calling me up and being like, hey, I'm getting asked a bunch of questions around like, you know, cyber insurance and how like perch fits it. We weren't really ever asked that. Like, I just didn't get those questions because I don't think it mattered. I think when you go through this era of like 2015, 16, 17 carriers are like, it's like Oprah, you know, you want insurance, you got it. You get insurance, you get insurance, everyone gets insurance. And then breaches really pick up 2018, 2019. And I remember being deep into all of that. It was like us and Huntress all the time going through stuff. And um, then you see all of a sudden the, the pullback in 2020 of the carriers being like, wait, wait a second. You know, well, I don't know about this. And then you hit the Kaseya attack. And to me, that was like the big culminator of all this for the carriers of like, uh oh, we've been kind of worried about MSPs as a whole anyway. And that was the moment that you saw a bunch of carriers just pull out. If you if you have MSP in your name, we're done. We're not doing this. We're right. We're not writing. We're out. And so I don't know, Ray, I guess my long winded answer there is no, I don't remember dealing with that. I feel like it, it just burst on the scene almost overnight. And I, you could see it coming, though, right? Like you can oh, see yeah. like yeah. I'm talking to all these breached companies and they they do. Many of them had insurance and it made it right. And I'm like, man, I can't believe they made that right. Like, wow, given what was going on there. And so, you know, they're not writing this for free. So it just had to happen. So it sounds like if I'm reading, if I'm hearing this right, the insurance companies were maturing on this at the same time the MSPs were maturing on this too, right? Is that is that kind of, and that that's not a bad thing. I mean, we we did this with the housing market, right? We did this with mortgage uh, banking when or mortgage brokers when you know you can make thirty grand a year and buy a two million dollar house. Um, you know, we we've gone through this before, and it sounds like it's just this for insurance. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so. I know there's a lot of FUD out there, and I, to be clear, Wes is just half joking about the witch doctoring. Even though we can, uh, we'll put a link to your. I like that everyone's course. jumping on it though. <laughs> yeah. Can By I? By the way, Wes, <laughs> Wes, didn't you actually have? Uh, there was a slide at some point that actually did have Oprah on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I okay. Yeah, I, just I always talk like it's, it's Oprah up yeah. in here. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Okay. And and that's that was one of my takeaways too. I mentioned this on MSP Dispatch where you know. The Kaseya breach, not for the number of people that were affected, it was, but it was definitely a pivotal point for the MSP world. And and Jeremy from Blumira also amazing product. We've also talked about on Partner First, um, awesome to partner with. Um, but you know the Kaseya incident, the massive exchange attacks, like these are pivotal points that brought awareness to the MSP landscape of MSP saying, "Oh damn, okay, wait a minute." Even if I wasn't affected by this specific thing, what I could be. And that was the scary part. And I think that's also been, at least on my end, that, that's also been the impetus for a lot of these in questions now, because now the MSPs are like, okay, we got to get our house in order. And, you know, insurance, now you guys are requiring the house to be in order for the most part, which is not a bad thing. I always said, you know, MSP legislation is going, or regulation is going to start with insurance. And I'm glad to see that's exactly what's happening. So, you know, let, let's talk about risk factors, right? Because we do have somewhat of an agenda we're not doing powerpoint because these guys are just way too interesting to talk to um so you know we didn't want to do any slides maybe we'll put some dictator coin or or the witchcraftery uh udemy on up there but you know we're, let's talk about how an msp tackles the area of risk that surrounds their daily work right what what does that mean exactly can you got that's a lot of words what, what does that actually mean I mean, I, I look at it from, I'm pretty one-sided on this, right, from the insurance side. And I'm sure Wes has, you know, a unique perspective. But, you know, when we first started getting into the channel, right, and uh, I got I to gotta throw kudos out to Jeremy Young because he is, he is very responsible for our involvement for not just with Dustin and Wes, but for Fifth Wall. Jeremy's good. Um, wow. He's yeah, so amazing, and, yeah. 
and yeah, actually he was, he was one of the first, you know, folks that I just started riffing with and talking about and trying to better understand. And we didn't really even know the pain yet because we started talking to MSPs and, you know, it was really basic. It was as basic as we are trying to manage our risk. We're trying to control it with the only way we know how right now, which is you're supposed to get insurance, right? That's how you, you can, uh, offset it. But we're getting told either we're being non-renewed for no reason. Our rates are going up five X for no reason. Uh, no one's actually provide any clarity here. And so this whole, okay, we need to think outside the box to manage our, manage our risk. That's kind of what, what it came into play. And so where fifth wall came into play was, okay, if, if we can't help and we are, we are helping if, if, but if we can't more directly help with trying to get good policies directly in the hands of MSPs, because the market as a, as a whole is kind of gone insane. Um, what are other ways you can look at your business to kind of start to, to build some more blocks around your business for protection. And that's at the client level. Right. And, and that's where we, you know, whenever we're coming in, we're, we're saying we really got to assist you in looking at that client's policy and what their safety net looks like, because if the client's better managing their risk, that means they're that much less likely to come after you um, and your, you know, so hmm. coming in, that's where we first started to kind of acknowledge the pain that we started to step into. Um, and Wes, oh. I'm sure you have some, some experience and points on that too. Let me, let me ask yeah, something. Right. Can you manage the client's risk without having your own house in order? Is that, is that even a possibility? Um, is it possible? Sure. Is it uh, likely to succeed? No. Right. Okay. And, you know, part of this brings this up is the lens that you look through for security for insurance is different than the lens of like actual good security. And here's what I mean by that. There are zero carriers. We work with what, 40 now? Is that right, Reed? Mm -hmm. So so we have wow. deeper access than I think anyone on planet Earth with carrier, a carrier level access. Zero of them ask things like, show me your control, your, your framework adoption for CIS. You know, where are you at? IG1, IG2, IG3. Where are you at in like CIS or uh, uh, NIST CSF? Where are you at with like, um, I don't know, 800-171 if you're a manufacturer? None ask those questions. None. All the, they're still like super control focused to an extreme. And so I, I, I say that to say from an, it, I hate to say this, and I think the day is going to change, but right now, from a risk management perspective with, with clients, if you're implementing all the right controls and you have all that in place, you probably have some policies in place like wire, money management policies, all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can actually manage it without doing anything on your end, which is an embarrassment. I think that's wrong. It's got to change. Yeah. But but here's what's going to cause it to change, Ray, is we're st like you're still going to see the losses continue to pile up from carriers. It's like, uh, you know, those cartoons you watch, like where you know, it's like a hole in the boat and like the cartoon character like plugs it and then another one comes out, he plugs it, plugs it. And he's like, use it like that's carriers right now. They're just constantly yeah. plugging holes and they're not realizing that they're on the wrong boat. And the wrong boat is like a, this control focused, exclusive yeah. look at security that will change. And when it does change, I think we'll finally be in a better position to where like you're forced to become a true risk manager. So let, let me ask the boogeyman question, because there's there's a lot of FUD out there and, and I want to dispel a lot of it. And, and, and you both have done amazing work as has Dustin you know, dispelling a lot of the FUD out there. But the boogeyman question is, okay, well, if a well practiced MSP is going to provide is more likely to provide better risk management for their clients, are the insurance companies vetting the MSPs or do they have any intention of it? Well, let me answer this part first. That's a and nervous Reed, grin from both of them, right? Reed there. can Reed can Reed can add to this. Reed can say a lot more things that I'm not allowed to say because he's an actual licensed agent. Uh, so you are seeing on uh, certain applications right now. Do you have an MSP? Name them. Do you have an MSSP? Name them. That's it. But I think there's a day coming where we'll probably see. Oh, we see that you named an MSP. We have an addendum that must be filled out by them. Fair, Reed. Yeah, it's kind of to your analogy, they're plugging holes as they come up. They're kind of learning as they go along through the path, right? I question how many carriers and actuaries actually knew about the MSP world until it became relevant for them, right? There wasn't right. actually forethought. So, you know, the applications kind of tell that story too, right? So like, I'm going to use MFA for an example, like started asking about MFA. Well, the way they were asking about it was really dumb because they're just asking, do you have MFA? We look at that and go, 
Where? Yeah, that Why? one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, on that one thing. Do you have it? And yeah. uh, okay, so fast forward six months. Now you see them start to ask more logical questions, right? Because someone said, someone knowledgeable was looking at that going, guys, you need to be looking more. So the reason I, I bring that up is I think with MSPs, they're starting to better understand the role, right? And they're starting to better understand, okay, we're asking for these things and they can be present, but who's managing them, right? So, and, and what does the I'm maturity look like there? Yeah. No, go ahead. So, so the takeaway there is while MSPs, because you see it all the time, MSPs are getting asked to give information that goes on these applications because they're the most knowledgeable for the client's sometimes hopefully the policies too but you know at least the technology stack at least the practices um as of today and i remember you talking about this at secure there's no liability today for that msp that's providing information but not attesting to anything correct now when it is yeah yes so when that addendum comes is that might that flip a little bit <clears throat> um no i think at the end of the day what a policy is, is it's a contract. And that contract is between that end client, the insured and the insurer, okay? The liability, um, now, whenever there's questions specific to that MSP and they're answering those questions on the MSP's business practice, which we're not really seeing yet, but could you say that that's to come possibly? Okay, now they're kind of in that line of questioning that's relevant to them. But their larger, the larger liability, the larger exposure for an MSP is between them and the client because the, the formula here is the client's not going to care until they go through an event. And then all of a sudden that policy isn't doing what they thought it was supposed to. And they think it's the MSP's fault. Right? Um, Are you seeing, I'm sorry, go ahead, Wes. Well, a couple of things. I mean, I read a hundred percent, right. Uh, there's le like, I see a lot of MSPs that have that fear of liability over them. That's like, I'm helping them fill out this, 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 uh, uh, this document, what happens if we're wrong here? Um, while there may not be liability there because it's to Reed's points between the client and the, in the insurance, those addendums that may come out may be used prior to the application being bound or the insurance policy being bound. In other words, Hey, we took a look at this. And even though there's no liability from the, the MSP's part, we didn't like what came back from the MSP. We're rejecting this thing. Right. And then I also think um, subrogation could potentially be an issue as well in terms of like in the forensics aftermath, if we determine that the MSP was negligent, and I don't mean fifth wall, I just mean the carriers, right. if they determined that there was negligence on the um, on the part of the MSP, well, now you may have subrogation that exists. There is still like liability that may exist, but I think the majority of it, they're just trying to get to a better stage where I think insurance feels like if we can, if we can better assess before we bind policies, we're going to mm -hmm. be better off with low, lower loss ratios. And they're still in that pursuit right now is how do we evaluate better? Because once we bind this, we got a ring on the finger and it's really difficult. I know there's a lot of like rumor of like insurance won't pay out for certain things. And Reed can answer that better than I can, but I that's, that it's more time. of a myth. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, once the yeah. ring's on the finger, you're, you're there. So it, it changes things a lot. With, with the right suitor, right? So you want to make sure that policy actually is. I, I think that the myth comes from, well, what are we actually referring to when we say cyber insurance, right? Because there's there's comprehensive and then there's things that belong in the garbage. But um, yeah, Wes is spot on. Um, there There's a reality with, uh, I don't know. Actually, the traveler's suit is a really good example of this. Yeah. And, and that, you know, for those that aren't familiar, Travelers went out and did something extremely bold that in our industry, you only do if you are 100% sure um, because it's going to blow up and it's going to be out in the open. And that's when you rescind the policy. It's basically saying, takes you backsies, right? Sorry. Nope. Not going to do it. Um, but they did that because doesn't happen. they- uh, That doesn't happen regularly. And that's- It that's really doesn't. Concern. Yeah. It, it, just so everyone's aware, that does not happen that often. And when it does, it's going to be big news. So when a carrier makes that decision- they know, okay, we're about to go under the microscope. We're about to get into the spotlight around this. Um, so you better be darn sure. And and the and what happened was, you know, a a company that did experience an event attested that they had MFA in place. Well, guess what? They did not. Now that was a pretty black and white, like it it was not there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So travelers had a pretty clean ground to stand on. There's areas where I get a lot of questions from MSPs, but it's in the gray. It's around, okay, well, do carriers have a preference on this EDR solution versus that? When they say EDR, like the definition of that can vary. 
Um, and, you know, a carrier, this is just a disclaimer, in my opinion, but like for, you're not going to see that anytime soon where a carrier is going to be that bold with something that's gray. They're going to be bold on the black and white, the things that are, are, are pretty clearly defined. Um, so just, just to kind of, you know, get that mindset out there on if, if there's a fear of something happening, uh, especially at the carrier level, I mean, it's got to be pretty explicit if, if they're going to call someone out on it. And I, I put a link to the story in the chat. So if anybody wants to go read it, it's actually really interesting. Um, but so let me ask you, are, are the, either one of you, are the carriers going back? Uh, well, first Tim brought up a good point. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he knows the difference between sub subrogation and segregation. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, Wes is using big words here. Uh, Wes, can you define subrogation for those outside of the insurance? No. Yeah. Well, I'll just use an easy example of this. Let's say I have uh, I get in a car wreck um, and it's someone else's fault. They were in the stop sign. They popped me good. Um, I had to go to the hospital, you know, and what's happening here is you're going to see um, my carrier go after that carrier and say that was not his fault. That was their fault. So we are going after them to recover the costs for the damages to Wes's car because they blew through the stop sign. Yeah. Pretty simple, right? So you, you see the yeah, same thing happen it, where it gets messy. And this is where things like Blue Mira are so important is it gets messy in the aftermath of a breach because oftentimes you talk to Chris Lair, he'll be the first to tell you, Psh, a lot of companies don't have anything. So we're starting with ground zero. We have no log data to really understand what happened. Um, and so uh, subrogation can sometimes get really me messy and nasty with cyber because we just don't have all the evidence oftentimes. Yeah, and so, one, one key piece of that real quick, where I, is that yeah. that occurs when you've got, a, so like, let's use the example of the relevant one, you know, when, when would it occur where an end client feels the need to segregate against a MSP's insurance, right? Hmm. Well, put yourself in the lawyer's mindset. And if, if it is clear that it's not my client's fault, it's someone else's fault, like, and, and they shouldn't be paying for the damage, it should, should be someone else. That's a fight worth it, worth fighting, right? Right. But it's also in an instance where if that client doesn't have a safety net, they're going to be looking where they can find one. So yeah. like, that's the importance of this kind of full circle, making sure you're evaluating everyone's you know, liability is, is citrical, right? So like, you want to make sure you're looking at the whole picture. Which is back to why you need to have your own house in order because you know what I mean? It's, it's one in the same. So that brings up two points I want to bring up because uh, Tim asked a great question, um, which I, you did talk about it secure, but I, I, it's relevant here. But first, um, are you seeing the carriers? I mean, we've had plenty of IR, you know, examples at this point, we had plenty of cyber insurance policies being paid out. Um, are you seeing them going back forensically and saying, not from the not from the scope of what happened, but from the scope of you said this on your application and we don't find evidence of this. Are we finding validation of that at the time of incident? Um, so like that's, yeah, that, that's it's one of those weird things where uh, during the soft market, when things weren't so bad, that did happen a fair amount. Like a, a good example okay. is there's a um, there's a clause in most insurance contracts that says that you're going you're doing some sort of. Uh, due diligence on funds transfer over a certain amount, right? You're mm -hmm. doing some sort of verification process. Most have that conditional language in place. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a carrier uphold that language until very recently, right? So like it took kind of when times got hard because because these are policies that are written to be in favor of the insured um, for, for carriers to go down that road. But Ray, to answer your question directly, I'm not seeing it a ton because like I said, when that happens, that is a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to get into the spotlight. But let me put an asterisk on that because you've got a, a wounded animal in a car corner, which are carriers that are losing a lot of money. Okay. Right, right. So let's expect that to happen more, just to be candid. Um, and, and, and so there's going to be different ways of when I say validation, right? There's different methods. And let's not be surprised too when we start to see different methods of, of trying to validate those answers because it's a once you're at a station, right? Right. So something right. that's constantly evolving. And so and right now, what they're doing is pure hot garbage. Let me get on a soapbox for a minute, man. If there's oh. something I'd throw off a helicopter, I'll tell you what. It's this right here we're is on the big screen at this point. Like I feel like this is where Wes is just gonna go off and be like, Yeah, you know. here here's what ticks me off, man, is we see these we see some carriers 
that are doing these like snake oil, like public IP block scans, you know, like I'll just call some out by name, not because I'm hating on the product, but because I'm hating of its use case for this, right? Like a security scorecard or a Corvus or one of those. And Ray, what they'll do is they'll, they'll like, tell us your IP segment. And then we scan it. And then we come back with this, like, here's like hacker chatter and like vulnerability history and botnet related traffic and all this stuff. And I've actually been, I've jumped on calls with clients that were denied coverage partially because of that. And I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, this is garbage, dude. This, none of this is right. I, I was on one car dealer who got denied. And part of the reason was because they had an old website, not no longer in use with a, like another web hosting provider that hadn't updated yeah. their stuff in forever. I hadn't even presence with the, I, with the car dealer, but you imagine all the Apache vulnerabilities that were just rife. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm like, guys, this is not how we do security like this, but they're grasping at straws. Like they're literally right. like, what can we do to like have better assessment? And then I think they hear from certain vendors that come in and they're like, oh, we can do all this scanning stuff. We can tell yeah. you their health. And you and I both know like how many attacks actually come through the front doors like that. Right. right. It's, it's right. like and on top of that, how much does that really actually guide me in a decision making process? So that's what some of them are trending towards right now. And it is not going to work. There's a better way to do it. And I think that better way to do it is, you know, insurance doesn't need to be like Sauron's all seeing eye, but they do need to have some better visibility, right? Like, so I think, and this is something we're really working towards at Fifth Wall, and you'll see us eventually come out with some stuff around this is like, what if we were to do a discount oriented, just like safe driving, right? You pop the little thing in your windshield and then it discounts you based on how good you drive. That's the way I think security should be. So the question is, what do we need to look at to say, we're giving you discounts on these things? Well, one of those is like proper configurations. Like I'll throw like Huntress. Let's say you're using Huntress and you have it rolled out to all of your users. I'm telling you, that's a measurable difference in your security. No doubt. You should get a discount on something like that, right? If it's properly configured, all your users have it, all that kind of stuff. So like there should be, we should be moving towards that kind of like direction towards security, not just control focused, but you know, let's throw our CompTIA friends out there, right? Let's say an MSP has an attested CompTIA Trustmark certification. Like they've gone through the assessment. That's valuable to me. That tells me that there's been some amount of like due diligence the MSP has put in place. So like, I know I'm on a soapbox here, but we're doing it all the wrong way right now in insurance. And it's if we don't fix it, it's going to get worse before it gets better. We're going to see, you know, premiums not going up double, triple, but 4X, 5X, 8X. Yeah. And we're going to see very few carriers that are even willing to write the risk for MSPs. So we got to get this fixed. Well, the risk is going to get mitigated, right? Whether the client and the MSP are mitigating the cyber risk or the insurance company is mitigating the financial risk for them, it's going to get mitigated. It's just a matter of who's controlling what. Um, I want to get back to some of the questions because we have a lot of questions in chat. Um, I just I want to touch on this briefly because yep. I, I know you talked about this already at, at ITNS. Uh, so Reed, who's responsible for cyber insurance policy misrepresentation? Signy, the person that signed on the dotted line of that application. So that is the end client. And I remember you guys talking about this on on the panel on the session, um, where you know the takeaway was whoever's signing with the insurance company that's the contract between those two parties, regardless. Mm -hmm. In absence of that addendum that we're well, made, yeah, and that's that, that was the con like at ITNS that was the, the the conversation because that was the specific question. But then what does that mean for an MSP? Because and that's that's the soapbox that I get on is then what you, what what are you then looking at it's that client is left with some decisions because they're being told either good things or bad things by the things that they invested in that, that insurance policy it's either doing whatever they they hoped it would do or it's not and if it's not because of that as station was incorrect well now that client is going to go look for answers right and right, maybe they're right. going to look for their own version of segregation so that's that's why it's really important yeah you're filling out these applications and technically no you are not in the line of liability when it comes to that insurance contract right but it is not a less is more situation you want to expand on anything you can there anything that you feel is gray make it black and white right make it clear that when you filled that out or you assisted in filling it out right that you told the truth you were factual and that there's there's nothing you're trying to to keep behind the curtain here um you're just doing yourself uh you're not doing yourself any favors if you're you're just trying to help your client get a policy because they want a policy keith writes a uh, keith nelson uh from vistum writes a really good point um let's see if i can get back to it it certainly sounds like 
There we go. Certainly sounds like with professionals like Wes and others, if we're listening, the MSP business can or has a unique opportunity to lead versus follow the trend, right? If we're we're setting ourselves up with Huntress, I, I've been a Huntress believer since I think I signed up in 2016. <laughs> so back in the day, um, you know, and they have their process insights and it's not a tool based thing. It's more about having your your house in order, having your stack. Um, and I, I am a firm believer of lead, answer the question before they ask. If you can show that you're doing the homework, you're much less, much less likely to get, you know, smacked on the hand. Um, and I, I like this, uh, has that, has this conversation happened on the back end with the carriers? Like if you are a member of an ISAC, ISAO, come to ISAO, remember, I'll remind you guys, I had the conversation with Wayne Selk. If you're an MSP member of CompTIA, you get free membership to the ISAO, which is an amazing organization. Um, and plus one for the trust mark. Absolutely. Um, so does that happen? I mean, it right have, now, insurance has considered it. No, nah, keep in mind, they're still swinging dead chickens, right? They're just not there yet. Uh, but uh, they can't even tell you an ISAO or an ISAC is like, I'm not even sure half these people that write these um, questionnaires can even turn a computer on. Right. Um, uh, so not yet, but I will tell you this though, Ray, we're having conversations with household. You see their commercials on TV names on uh, the carrier side. They're like, Hey, we're learning more about this MSP thing and we're seeing you guys everywhere. Can we have a conversation And hundred percent reading? are like, yep, let's jump on that call. We usually bring Dustin Bolander on too. Cause he's awesome. Cause he represents an MSP and he's advising mm -hmm. fifth wall. So, uh, we'll all three jump on and, and sort of teach them about this. And, and I'm, I'm excited about that because, I think the problem is for some of these carriers, cyber is such a small component of what they write for, of all these different types of insurance. They just don't care enough in, in some cases. And so we're starting to see that change. And you're seeing like dedicated security people that are coming on board that are responsible for this and trying to understand the industry. And that's awesome because I think the more we get their ear, the more we can start designing things that are far better. For example, we go back to Huntress again, or you take Blue Mira. When you look at the questionnaires, like do you have a SIM in place? Blue Mira is not listed. Not because Blue Mirror is right. not great. It's awesome. But they just don't know who it is. Same with Huntress. So there are just things like that. Or, or another example is they're asking the wrong questions. You look at some of these and like, um, for example, I was looking at a Beasley application right here. And, and one of the things they ask about is like privileged account management. Do you use privileged account management? Let me tell you what. That's one of the biggest questions I would ask in depth to an MSP. Do you have privileged access management for all your clients? And do you use unique service accounts for every single access for every client? You, or are you just sharing the same username and password for service accounts for all your clients because it's easy. It's hard for MSPs to solve that, but that's a critical question. So like this has got to get changed, Ray. We, we got to start changing the nature of what we're doing. And I want to yeah. be on the front of it. The reason I came to Fifth Wall is I want to be on the front of leading that and I want to bring MSPs back in. And I, and I would love of, for us. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no, go ahead, man. Go ahead. I was last thing I was just going to say, I'd love to sort of turn this into like a what is it like a union almost turned like MSPs into like a union that comes back and says, this is good. This is bad. This is how we're going to do things. And this is what, yes. this is not the way we're going to do things. Case in point, you remember when data was denied by all state for their agents. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to Ryan weeks about that. And Ryan was like, I am all in on fixing this problem. What the heck just happened? What was the rationale for that? where did that come from? And he, he went, he went to deep links to, to go correct that. Uh, that shouldn't happen. But on the other side, what if we could actually make that happen in the right ways when a vendor does the wrong thing that we all know in oh, an yeah. industry? And I'm not picking any vendors right now in my mind, but when they do something that we all know is incorrect, maybe now we have the buying power to come in and say, no, that's not going to happen anymore. This is a way, this is what good looks like. That's the future that I'd yeah. love to see. And, and that's the thing. It's not even, we're not even talking an expensive thing because most of this stuff is policy driven. It's not even tech driven. But then you have vendors like, uh, I'll put out Blue Mirror again. Blue Mirror has free uh, free NFR, their highest level of, of service, free NFR for SIM, you know, and it's uh, assisted SOC, assisted remediation stuff. So they we use them internally. So I'm talking as a customer, um, you know, they tell you what to do. We're putting the link where we did a special report with Tracy Orozco at Huntress with their neighborhood watch program. They're giving free NFR. They're uh, committing $5 million to protecting MSPs at no cost, uh, giving them. So these are major tools you have access to, to use yourself, to protect yourself. There's not a lot of excuse why MSPs can't do better. I'm all for vendor accountability. Lord knows I, you know, if the vendor screws up, I'm the first on the, uh, well, maybe not the first, Jason Slagle probably beats me there, but you know, I'm right behind him, you know, waving the pitchforks and stuff. But 
MSPs got to do better too. You know what I mean? MSPs have every opportunity to do better and vendors like this are making it that much easier. Um, Keith has a question here. Uh, and this is for either of you. Um, do you see the connection between insurance and legislation? And I think that's kind of where in the arena of what Wes was talking about. Reed, you take a swing at that one. Yeah, it's getting um, the closest we're seeing is, is, you know, um, now there's a fear in, in the insurance world of, of maybe a big swing that might have happened federally. But um, we see it more at the state level. Um, we're starting to see um, like California, for example, um, that is is put into effect that they, you know, ransomware payments will not be paid on certain industries in certain industry classes, certain businesses. Um, I think at the state level, we're starting to see it more and more. I mean, you're seeing um, like NYDFS came out in 2000. 18 2017 so it's been around for a while but you know is looking at, at core uh business sectors right to say okay if you're doing this if you're of this size of professional services you need to carry this policy right so they're starting they're starting it's trickling um and it's been trickling for some time so it's tough to say i think it's it's it's, it's a touchy subject too um but at the state level we're kind of seeing them seem trickle in and you are seeing um some interesting state movements that um, are like sort of coming alongside that question. For example, here in Florida, um, state agencies are not allowed to pay ransomware anymore. I don't know if anyone ever saw that news article that came out, but um, uh, our state legislature has now made that a hard and fast rule. You're not mm -hmm. paying ransoms. If, if you're like a state group, state, I'll have to find the link, but if you're like some kind of state run, state funded organization, you, you just can't pay ransoms. Uh, wow. I think that's kind of cool. Um, we're also yeah, seeing, I, I also think we're also seeing a reduction in ransomware volume and payout amounts right now. And I'm curious, is that the economy? Is that the war in Ukraine where attentions are elsewhere? Are we actually doing better? I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but we're starting to see a trend towards things getting better. We actually are seeing a trend towards things getting better, but I don't know yet if that's like long term or not. So I, I want to turn this to a little bit of fun. Uh, and I want to thank, you know, we have uh, Martin, who's uh, just joined recently OIT. I want to thank uh, Tim Golden, uh, who you say the word policy and he just gets super excited. Uh, you can go check him out over at uh, compliancerisk.io. Uh, awesome guy. And he's in the ConnectWise Pitch It uh, event also. So uh, definitely want to give him a shout out um, along with other friends. But I want to go to the fun. And Kelvin proposed a really good question. And for this, we're going to do some giveaways. So... We want to hear from you guys in the chat too. The best two stories, we're going to give you a $50 gift card uh, for swag over at our store. Um, but we'll start with Reed. What's the weirdest stuff Fifth Wall has seen so far during the underwriting? And we can extend that to just you. Oh. What, what's the weirdest thing you've seen so far during underwriting? I mean, the most fun I've had is Wes's reaction to the vulnerability scanning, candidly, just because that just gosh, does it irritate him so much? And I've, I've grown numb to it at this point. Um, it's kind of like I mean, when you watch like TV and you see them doing IT, IT stuff and you're like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> like the IP address is 555.555. You're like, ah, you know. It is not as seen on TV. Um, you know, I, I don't think this is weird. It's just frustrating because we, we still see, um, the, the first story that came to mind was I was sitting at a table with, I'm not going to name names, but this, this is a company that was over 2 billion in revenue. Okay. And, uh, I'm sitting with the, uh, it and with a lot of the C-suite and we're going through just the list of exposures and evaluating the risk, yada, 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 doing the fun agency stuff. And the, uh, the consensus was, okay, we need to make sure you have, you know, these things and MFA was on there. And you could see in the IT person's eyes, like, yeah, like looking at me like, oh yeah, we're on the same page, right? Like we're on the same team here. I'm like, yeah. And the CEO is looking over and he asked the IT person, okay, do you think we need this? And uh, he's like, absolutely. Like without a doubt. In fact, I've been telling you, we should be doing this for the past five years. They talked a little bit and they say, you know what? I don't think we should. And I made a point and I said, I, I'm sorry, isn't that what you pay him to do? Isn't that his job? Right. Um, but the, the, the moral of the story here is, is it's clear that awareness level, just it, I understand the pain and the frustration of dealing with that end client around the, uh, you just want to shake them by the shoulders. Right. Um, but mm -hmm. the, 
sometimes that will get you not only fired but in jail. So yeah, that's a different uh, different uh, risk tolerance. So <laughs> that's a yeah. different conversation. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, Keith putting uh, my strangest, or I'm sorry, yeah, Keith putting my strangest hurdles: CNC machines and military aerospace manufacturing. That's a mouthful. And multi-user shop floor terminals. Insurance doesn't understand lean and manufacturing needs. That, that brings up a good point, though. What about that, you know, Windows XP embedded CNC machine that there's no man, the manufacturer doesn't exist anymore and there's no way to upgrade it. Most MSPs I know will like air gap it and just, you know, but how does the insurance company care? Do they, does the carrier care about that stuff? It is a shotgun approach and you're going to see that carriers, we've done too many conversations where we've had to go quote unquote manual because carriers like to do things as, uh, you know, they're trying to scale, right? So they're trying to do things fast and they'll decline someone. And then you have to, it's our job then to physically get them to stop, look at it, walk them through it and they go, oh yeah, that, that probably doesn't matter. Right. So we change our position. But otherwise, if you didn't take that time, they would have just moved on. So yeah. like they're moving too fast. I'm looking at Beasley's right here, just again, as an example. And they ask, um, do you do you have any end of life or end of support software in your network? No, don't know or yes. <laughs> don't know. Is, wow. Uh, anyway, uh, then uh, they they ask if yes, is it segregated from the rest of the network? And then mm -hmm. if yes, do you purchase additional support from the software where available? So they're getting, some of them are getting fine grain to at least ask some of that question, those questions to sort of gain. They're, they're typically to Reed's point, like they, they, I think they understand when you have the conversation, look, this is business mission critical. Like it's CNC machines are the way they are, you know, or healthcare with like old school, like cat scanning machines that the doctor doesn't oh, want to yeah. get rid of. It happens. So yeah, I think they understand designing controls around that, uh, but sometimes it requires that conversation, as Reed said. Well, it's not even a want. Sometimes these machines are three, four, five hundred thousand dollars to replace, right? There, there is no upgrade. You have to buy a brand new machine. Yeah. Um, so we got here, Tim, uh, again coming in with the hot stuff. Uh, I do want to get to your weirdest story, Wes, but real quick, um, can you give some common reasons a carrier would deny a policy in the first place? And also, I, I don't even know if I want to get into the next gen conversation. I, I think that'll be Wes talking for the next three hours because I can only imagine. That's another term um, I'm going to push off the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a separate. Uh, we'll do a separate uh, session on on web root and why it's next gen AV. Um, but you know, can you give? Can you guys give some reasons why you could be denied a policy? Yeah, most common right now they are so control focused, right? And so they're looking at those core controls. And they're looking at MFA and they're looking at segregated backups as like the two main swings at the plate. So, I mean, that, that is, that is what we're seeing is, is the, I mean, it's still happening so much. You would be amazed. Um, it's just something really basic of, of someone not having those core controls in place. So I want to bring up, um, <clears throat> cause I want to be respectful of time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and answer this instead of the hosts, uh, typical, What's the typical story for a client having an incident? What's the insurance carrier did before agreeing to pay or not? Um, and do logs have to be sent, images taken? Uh, we did talk a little bit about that, uh, about the forensic side of it. The uh, So go back and watch the beginning of it because we did talk about it. We are going to have the, con the contact information for Wes and Reed here as well. Uh, so reach out to them. Um, so... And oh, good. Wes has some uh, has a link. Of course, he does. <laughs> we have a link for best practices to lead to cyber insurance. So we'll go ahead and share that in the chat and put it on here. Um, Wes, I want to give you the opportunity, though. Your your weirdest insurance uh, related story. Uh, this I mean, you have the ones that are just hilarious and bizarre. Like I had a client fill out um, for EDR. They wrote in, do you have managed EDR? Yes. Uh, specify which they wrote Windows 2008 server. <laughs> like. Oh no, we've got problems here. We jumped on a phone call with them and boy, nice. that was important. Um, but one of my favorites was an auto dealer of, of sorts that um, about 200, 250 million in revenue. And uh, I still have their, their, uh, their questionnaire it, and it's, it's amazing, right? Like they've never done patching ever, never, never done it. No security awareness training, MFA for IT admins, but not the regular users. I mean, you just name it, all the stuff in that guide I just shared, like the five best practices, they weren't doing any of them. And what was crazy, Ray, is I'm sitting there on this call and it was the CEO, it was their IT manager in-house, and it was their MSP. 
And so I'm calling their baby really ugly. I'm trying to be nice mm. about it. Like you guys know, I try to be pretty nice in the way I'm talking. I'm like, yeah, you know, so guys, wow. If you're not doing any kind of vulnerability scanning and patching, like you have no idea exactly what's in your network, right? And like, there could be some pretty, you know, so I'm trying to like really nicely tell them like, you guys, how does this IT dude even have a job is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And after the conversation was over, he's the, you know, the CEO jumps in. He's like, hey, thank you. This is helpful. We're going to go and take this into action. He said, but I just have to ask you, is, is there any way we could get like a 30 because they got denied he's like can i get a 30 day extension and i'm like no you really can't i'm sorry you know no he's like okay i just thought i'd ask he goes but you know he goes i want you to know and he got real apologetic with me like like yeah. almost like i'm he's talking to like a police officer or something you know he got pulled over and he's like i want you to know this is priority one for us and we will not work on anything else until this is solved we will fix this this i'm sorry we let this happen it'll never happen again i promise you that and I, Ray, my point on that is like, I'm listening to this. I'm like, holy crap. Finally, a CEO like really cares because yeah. he, from a risk perspective, he got dropped and he's looking up there being like, we got nothing overhead to protect us. When something happens, we screwed up. And, and I don't know if he chewed out the IT guy in the background or not, but I will tell you this, the MSP later emailed me and said, Hey, thank you. He, he said, I've been trying to get them to do these things for the longest time. You know how car dealers are. He goes, finally, I have an open slate to make it all happen. The guy literally emailed me and said, that. make it happen. Tell me the price. We'll do it. I'm I'm like, yes, yes, if that's what it takes. I love that. And and okay. Tim Fournette over at Roost brings uh, automation for MSPs, um, brings up an awesome point. My problem with the most questionnaires, they rarely define the terms. This is where, and I'm amazed that we got to 59 minutes into this without actually saying this, this is where fifth wall really comes in for the MSPs, right? Like you're helping them navigate the waters for their clients. You're helping them you know, understand what it is they're talking about, finding the best policies for the client so that, and if there's areas for opportunities for improvement, you guys are having the conversation with the MSPs to understand what needs to get done so it can get done. Did I state that properly, guys? There's a, it's, it's coming out very soon. We're excited. It's called LODA, which stands for Lord of the Apps because we're cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, that is exactly what we're trying to solve because, uh, Man, I wish carriers just knew what they were doing, but they don't, and they're not—they're not operating with any level of standardization in, in what they're—they're they're looking for. So, yeah, we we try to put ourselves on the front end to make that intake really simple and easy. Let us deal with the headache. Let us deal with the mess. Let us deal with that lovely conversation at the carrier level. But um, yeah, it's it's something that we're trying to kind of force ourselves. If 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 no one else is doing it, we'll do it ourselves. We'll we'll try to standardize it to a level to at least make the MSPs life easier and more comfortable and that's that i mean and that's what it really that's when i go talk to vendors about vendor accountability you know that's that's what i'm asking for make the msp's life a little bit easier because they really have a hard job i remember when i was an msp it was frustrating i had much more much less gray hair back then uh and it's 10 times worse now it's 10 times more complicated so that's a wrap for partner first i i want to thank reed and wes uh for coming on guys don't go anywhere we have uh quick upcoming events we're going to include the contact information for them in the show notes it's not like you can't find these guys they're literally everywhere um, so you know but find them talk to them and get your house in order and help start securing your clients so we can be in the news for good reasons, not the bad reasons. I'd love to see clients spared, you know, cyber risk because MSP stepped up and saved the day. I want to see that story in the times. Uh, but Reed, Wes, thank you so much, guys. I, I appreciate you. Bray, you're amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Absolutely. Ray. Simon, what do we got coming up, dude? Yeah, so we do have a couple of events uh, for next week and for tomorrow. So tomorrow we have the MSP Dispatch Week Wrap-Up. Uh, presented by the MSP Nemelia Network. Uh, catch up on the industry's latest news. On Tuesday, we have at 10 a.m., uh, we're back with the MSP Dispatch, the, the news that happened over the weekend, so make sure you tune in on that. We're also going to be live at the Seven Figure MSP Live event in Charlotte, North Carolina next week, and we do have some free passes. Uh, so if you guys visit the link below, you guys will be able to claim a free pass. Uh, come hang out with Alex, and I will be at the event. Uh, and then on September 1st, we're back at 6.30 p.m. ET uh, with the Tech Bar Podcast episode 42 with Vince of Dark Cute. So make sure you tune into that. I love Vince. Vince is a great guy. All right. Thank you very much, OIT family. We appreciate you. Reed, Wes, you guys are awesome. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to have to do this for a third round because there's just so much to talk about. It's it's ridiculous. Anytime. Uh, 
Thanks. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. All right. Thanks.